<laughs> You've waited years for this. I've waited years. This was almost the perfect day. Almost. Rosetta was and is a unique space mission. It's a travel not just in space, it's also a travel back in time to the very early days of the solar system. This is the story of the epic, ambitious mission to land a spacecraft on a comet hurtling through space. Nothing like it had ever been attempted before or since. Rosetta completely transformed our, our view of comets. It was a mission 25 years in the making that all came down to a few frantic hours. Fila was not anchored. It bounced. We don't know where it is. But let's go back a bit to 2004. The Rosetta spacecraft, with its little Fila lander tucked away inside, is about to launch. Three, two, unité. Top, à l'image EAP, décollage. Uh, well, the, the actual launch took place on 2nd of March in 2004. The first part of the mission was just to catch up with the mysterious comet, known as 67P. That took 10 years, during which time everything on board Rosetta was powered down, only to be woken up as it neared the comet. It was quite a nervous time when Rosetta was coming out of the hibernation. Because if it didn't wake up, that, that was curtains, really. Billion euros of kit out in space, and uh, if it didn't call home at the expected time, um, there was very little that could be done about it. And then it got this, it got this signal, wake up Rosetta, and it's just like, hasn't woken up. All right, send the signal again. Uh, switch it off and switch it on again. Ta-da! It's woken up, which was just so, so much of a relief. Hurdle one, out the way. When Rosetta woke up, that, that was really the point where everybody got excited again. We had no idea how the comet would look like. We don't know what shape it is, it's probably spherical-ish. We didn't immediately see the high uh, quality images. We saw better and better ones, the closer and closer uh, Rosetta came. Then, wow, what shape is that? The shape is not potato shaped as we expected, not roundish, it's, it's... The comet has this kind of rubber duck shape. It's like one of those yellow plastic ducks. And that made hurdle two that extra bit harder. Landing Philae safely on top of it. There was no area on this comet which is nice and smooth as we have hoped for. The terrain was, was rough everywhere. Um, so there was a risk. Uh, but that also made it fascinating and, and interesting. Philae was equipped with little harpoons to fire off to help it cling to the comet once it made contact. And the landing site had to be meticulously chosen to allow Philae to recharge its solar batteries in the glow of the sun. The stakes were huge. This was a lifetime's work for most of the scientists on the Rosetta mission. The team already knew there may be a problem with the thrusters that were supposed to slow down Philae's approach but the time had come to deploy Philae. And on the 12th of November, 2014, off it went. One could see the Philae lander as it moves away from the main spacecraft, getting smaller and smaller with the landing gear successfully uh, deployed. I found this already very emotional to see the baby go after 10 years attached to the spacecraft. You now see it in, in freedom uh, on its way the last 22 kilometers uh, to the surface of the comet. And then Phila was free falling for almost exactly seven hours to the surface of the comet. Everybody was, you know, jittery and just waiting and waiting and waiting for, for, for the signal to say it had landed. And then... <laughs> I just went absolutely Hey, it's landed, it's landed, I'm so excited, it's landed, it's landed. <laughs> you know, it was, it was just the, the tension that had wound up and the release of that tension and the relief. You've waited years for this. I've waited years. <laughs>
tears. I'm so, so excited. I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. It's fantastic. It's and of course, everywhere in the world, in the control rooms, in the scientific teams, people started to open the champagne and started to celebrate. It landed. It was fantastic. It was wonderful. Everybody was really, really, really happy. In the control room, we thought, yeah, great. We are landed. We have to touch down signal. But the mood in the control room was suddenly very different. Something wasn't quite right. Within a few minutes, we realized that although we have landed and although we still got radio contact, which was positive, we did not anchor and the lander was moving again. And then uh, the principal investigators came out of their little cocoon and Ian came up to me and he gave me a big hug and I gave him a big, big hug and I said, oh, you know, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's really great, you know, you must be so, so proud and pleased. And he said, no, uh, has this gone wrong? It bounced. We don't know where it is. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it hasn't been announced yet, but it will be announced in a minute that actually feel, feel I did land, but the, the harpoon didn't anchor it and the little crampons on the, on the legs couldn't get a grip. And so it, it's bounced. And we had no idea what's going on, where we would jump and how we would land and when we would land. Oh dear. Philae had crashed off the face of the comet and bounced about one kilometre back into space. Any further, and it risked escaping the comet's weak gravitational pull and drifting off into space forever. Anxiously, they waited. We had no idea whether this would be a successful mission or would be just a touch and, and we would never again hear from the lander. And then the news came in. So we did land somewhere uh, and we still had radio contact we still received signals and this was the moment of great relief because that was the moment where we knew we are at the surface and we can still communicate with the lander but the good news didn't last long it landed in the shade not great for something reliant on solar power this meant they had less than 72 hours of battery time to undertake months worth of scientific collection the clock was ticking. So it's one of those things, it's like, okay, let's just throw away 10 years worth of calculations and let's just redo them all over the space of five hours. <laughs> Which is what they did. We also optimised the sequence in a way to get the maximum science out of the energy available. Once they knew they'd only got 70 hours, and, and it was just going to seep away. It's like, it wasn't if you turned all the instruments off, the battery would stay at that particular level. No, because it was so cold, it was having to maintain, it was having to keep heaters on as well, you know, to make sure that the instruments kept working. So you just knew you got 70 hours full stop. All right, so you worked for 70 hours. You, you just did it, you just barreled through. Get as much data as we can. And amazingly, Almost all of the instruments on Philae had survived the impact. It was go time. We were very lucky. I mean, we ended up in an orientation that the antennae were pointing, uh, well, upward, so to say, that we could establish a radio link uh, with the main spacecraft. And again, we were also lucky uh, because we could switch on the instruments. We could do fantastic signs from the surface of the comet. A about 80% of the science goals of the, the, the Philae lander were achieved. So it was an absolute fantastic success. You know, the fact it crash landed, got around that. It was an amazing success. This was of course a bit sad to see the voltage of the battery drop and, and knowing that Philae will go into a hibernation. And eventually that's what happened. But even in those few hours, Philae had unveiled a world full of surprises, of dust and debris. Gases erupted from deep within the comet. Even the crash landing threw up interesting discoveries. Even by analysing the bounce itself, uh, we got information on what's, what's the surface made of. And it was a bit surprising that the surface was rather hard. But perhaps most exciting of all was what this comet was able to teach us about us. The Rosetta mission had as one of its goals 
to understand the building blocks of life. Because Comet 67P was rich in organic compounds like phosphorus, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and the amino acid glycine, all essential for the origins of life and offering tantalizing clues as to how these compounds may have arrived on Earth in the first place. So the original building blocks of life came from comets. While Philae had gone into eternal hibernation, the mothership Rosetta continued to fly around the comet, collecting data for two more years. But then, Rosetta's time had to come. In a last-ditch effort to get as much out of the mission as possible, the team decided to crash-land Rosetta into the comet. Collecting data along the way, and allowing the scientists to get one last look at their old friend Philae. Took this sort of shallow dive onto the surface of the comet and, and then sort of crash landed and its camera was going the whole time. So we saw these last pictures of the, of the, the, the surface rushing up to greet Rosetta. And then the signal died and you got this little sort of oscilloscope thing with nothing on it. Just like, you know, like somebody when they die and you see the, the signal die on the heart thing. And it was just like, it was, it was so devastating. People were in tears, I cried. And it's just, hell's teeth, it's a robot, you know. But it's been part of your life for so long and so important. So that was it, that was the end of the Rosetta mission. There is still many, many publications done using the data from Rosetta. That's still the most relevant and best uh, scientific information we have uh, from a comet. Rosetta completely transformed our, our view of comets. To some extent what we know about the uh, evolution of the solar system, and what we believe about the formation of life, uh, all of this is, is triggered uh, by Rosetta and this is not often in lifetime you get a chance to get involved in, in such a project.